who is Cornelius Campbell. So he did his PhD in Innsbruck before moving to Sydney to head up their trapped iron efforts there. And then he was brought back to PSI, where he is primarily based, but also has one foot at ETH Zurich and one foot still in University of Sydney. And I'm not sure quite how that works and how often you visit, but it's curious. Anyway, today he's going to talk to us about tracked iron for computers and the challenge of scaling them. Um, and is happy to take questions throughout. Thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope the pizza was great, and I'm thankful for that. It usually draws a bigger audience. So my job today is to introduce trapped iron quantum computers and talk about the challenge of scaling. When I looked at the abstract that I submitted, I found a sentence that said, oh, I'm also showcasing highlights in quantum simulation and quantum computation, and then realized, oh, that's another two hours. So um, I'm hoping that none of you are here just for that because then there'll be a fairly limited amount of that in the talk. But without further ado, um, let me jump in what I will be presenting today. So I'll give you an introduction, of course, the goal and motivation why we actually pursue trapped ions and why in general do you want to build a quantum computer and what's, what's the status, where are we with this? The setting at PSI is what I'll also speak about briefly and of course my team's research areas, but actually quite broad. The center of the topic, of course, is the trapped ions and how they work. So I'll give you a brief introduction, um, hoping to show you, you know, intuitively somewhat uh, how this works. It's not going to be too much math, so I'm hoping that all these slides remain accessible. If there's any question in between, please just raise your hand or just even shout out. So no worries. Please interrupt me anytime. And the last part, that's what I refer to. The quantum error correction would easily fill a day, and the quantum simulation too. So I limited it to two things, two examples, one being the color code, that's uh, one of the avenues to implement quantum error correction. And the other one is the simulation of chemical dynamics. And that connects to what I would say more of a near-term impact of quantum computers, where, again, we don't know when it's going to happen, whether it's going to happen. I'm, for one, quite optimistic. But it takes a completely different approach to quantum, and uh, not the usual quantum computer style. So to get started, let me start by damping the mood. So with this kind of graph, which is probably the one that you never put on the first page of a grant proposal, because it tells you, well, we are working on a future project, and you better fund us for the next few decades. Um, basically, what this comes down to, and this has been nicely uh, discussed in this uh, manuscript by our colleagues at Hust, is uh, Professor ETH, and Matthias now moved to uh, Microsoft, but used to be at ETH. Um, the question is when a quantum computer will be useful. And the reality is there is this crossover point. Quantum computing involves lots of overhead. It's not fast. And, uh, and the downside of that is, of course, you need to find the right problem. Because only if your problem is large enough that it actually warrants to use a quantum computer, then you should use a quantum computer. But also, you see there's a Y scale here, which talks about minutes and weeks. So you can also see we are expecting a quantum computer, and this is using real numbers that they, it's not just drawn up like that, they actually have in the paper in numbers to back this up. Given that we have these powerful GPUs today, uh, classical computing is very powerful. And if you followed over the recent, say, uh, four years or so, these various claims to fame, to quantum advantage of problems that are insurmountable with classical hardware, and then a few weeks later, there's another paper saying, oh, we've done it in 0.2 seconds. Oh, and there's no scaling overhead. So there is a whole lot in classical computation uh, that is still untapped and that can be optimized. So one really needs to find the right problem because these classical computers are not good. So as I said, um, it needs to run for a long time. So that leads us to quantum error correction, which is part of what motivates this whole effort. And um, you need to be able to run, of course, for long enough but that also means you should not make any errors. So you need to suppress these errors, again, with quantum error correction. So that's the long term. Um, the near term, and that's the potential near term, that I, as I call it, is that when you're talking about quantum objects, and that's really what motivated the area of quantum simulation and has now led to this really huge interest in quantum computing you know, for chemistry, for all those applications, is that we're trying to calculate quantum mechanical problems. And there's this nice parallel to quantum devices. So if you find a problem that requires a large enough Hilbert space, and if you're lucky, it doesn't have symmetries that uh, your colleagues from chemistry exploit and then solve it classically, then you might use a quantum machine to obtain an advantage. The, clear, the specific path is not clear, but that's 
certainly one thing for the other. <coughs> Long story short, though, we want to build a computer that takes time and requires a lot of technology. So uh, to also introduce the setting, I've got this table that I really need to update, I'm sure, but it's probably close enough to the current state of the art. Superconducting circuits and trapped ions, and you might object, oh, there's no neutral atoms on this yet. Yes, indeed, I need to add them as well. Um, but the main thing I want to highlight here is not all the numbers. You can read them. But that with uh, the number of physical qubits, and I can probably use my mouse to the point, um, yeah, because that works. Um, Superconducting qubits are very hard to beat. You can manufacture them at scale. IBM has really demonstrated that quite impressively here. Um, when you come to trapped ions, you're really looking at different orders of magnitude, and these are including big you know, corporates that build this. When then you look at benchmarks, you see sometimes the complete inverse. Then suddenly these smaller systems perform far, far better than the other ones. But you know, there's subtlety. So benchmarks are not an absolute thing. If you believe in quantum volume, which is a very good benchmark, um, that really depends on what the application is that you pursue. So for example, IBM's current design will limit that. They can just not go any higher because their connectivity won't let you. So it really depends on what you want to do. But the main takeaway from this slide is that there are two yellow lights, I would say, here for the superconducting circuits. And for the ions, it's a bit further stretched. So one is great. All these ions are the same. So we don't have to worry about uh, intermediates when it comes to the qubits. But the scaling is pretty hard. And that's basically what this uh, talk is about. And that's also, with these two technologies, what our location is about. So the PSI, Hochschild Institute, also part of the ETH domain, lives in a beautiful landscape in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you've not seen it, Filigan PSI, you can look it up. We've got our own postcode, by the way. Um, we also have lots of large-scale facilities. Uh, so you can see the Swiss light source, the synchrotron, the muon source. So lots of particle physics. There's a free electron laser high precision particle physics here. Uh, I think there's a zero magnetic field room, lowest magnetic field on Earth. Quite impressive large scale facilities. And radio pharmacy, proton therapy, because we have a proton accelerator. Uh, we have even the medical aspects covered. And there's energy systems research. This unlabeled building here contains spent nuclear fuel rods. So I haven't told you. But uh, that's where there's a hot lab. Uh, so we're basically looking at how these container vessels degrade. So that's more or less what PSI does at a core mission. And there's a question. Uh, this is just with the previous slide, because I've never seen the term quantum volume before. Can you just explain what that refers to? So the quantum volume, uh, it's kind of funny that it's called volume when it's actually an area. <coughs> so I say 9 by 9 and 19 by 19. The way it's defined, you can imagine, is roughly the number of qubits on the Y scale, uh -huh. and then the length of a circuit. So if you say there's nine quantum gates or nine operations, nine layers would be the language for quantum volume, and over nine qubits, then if you execute that, you can calculate a probabilistic outcome. So this comes down to statistical sampling. So you're calculating that on the quantum device, and you can calculate on the classical device. And if your classical device, which works perfectly uh, for this small example, has a distribution, and you have the quantum distribution that you got from your quantum device, and you compare the two, you can define a threshold. You know, either you pass that test, or you don't pass it. And when you do that, and you increase the number of qubits, and the length of the computation, it becomes harder classically, for sure. But at 19, you can still do it. And so it's basically like a, a tick mark. Do you pass the quantum volume test? Yes or no? Then we give you that number. The downside is <laughs> it's defined as a logarithm. So in fact, this is a square, you know, 2 to the power of 19. This is why you get these large numbers here. And so the quantum volume has been used, if you look at the marketing literature, quite extensively. People claiming lots of things, uh, but maybe not the best. But it's basically a benchmark that's supposed to encapsulate everything, qubits and gate operations. All right, then uh, speaking of quantum, there it is. That's the facility that I'm part of, the ETH Zurich PSI Quantum Computing Hub. Um, that was basically born, and of course, this is roughly how far away things are. And this was born primarily out of the uh, need for building a technology testbed. And so that was also partly why these two platforms were chosen. The uh, idea being that if you want to scale things up, you really need long-term uh, technical expertise. You can't just do that, sorry you guys, uh, with you. Because when you are experts, that's when you leave, that's when you graduate. And that's what really makes it you know, suck at universities. The experts are the ones that leave. 
when you start, yeah, you know, ramping up, but once the experts and all the know-how is there, you take it with you. And so that's why you know, national labs like PSI would be a natural place to actually retain the know-how, retain the knowledge. And um, we also would love to have a way to host these things in the cloud so that you can actually use Swiss quantum computers in the cloud. That's also where PSI would be a natural place because they're used to hosting user facilities, that's what it's called. So you have the device there, it's run and operated there, but then you access it over the cloud. And you know, this quantum computing CERN is maybe a bit aspirational, but <coughs> you'll see later one slide that gives you an idea of the scale of an error corrected quantum computer. Um, it's not far off from what a CERN detector looks like. And, uh, and that's for small qubits. Okay, so how did that start? So there's expertise in mapping circuits and trapped ions at ETH Zurich, and luckily enough, that was before the budget crisis uh, commenced. <coughs> and they found enough money um, to give us a startup budget with a mission to really set up this facility, having the two technologies, and really at a national lab at scale so that we can uh, go from there and build it up. And the idea really being that long-term staff positions are available at PSI. Um, you can have tenure without being a professor, basically, is what that means. Um, it commenced in 2020 with a building that we uh, repurposed. Um, first orders went out, and then in August 2021 is when we really started for real. There's since been quite a bit of reorganization uh, at PSI, so now we, a new laboratory was created. <laughs> So this is the LNQ, headed by Kirsten Moselund, who is a professor here at EPFL. And it involves both nanotechnology and quantum technology. And so there's a clean room, basically, at PSI and various lithography uh, efforts um, that form one part of that. And the other one is the trapped ion quantum computing, superconducting circuit quantum computing, neutral atom quantum engineering, and bosonic quantum information programs. Because it's a national lab and governments like to make things complicated, you can see lots of Venn diagrams. So the quantum computing hub does not completely overlap with everyone. We are affiliated with ETH Zurich. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated structure, but basically there is now this effort headed, at, uh, headed by Kirsten at PSI to really bring quantum technology uh, to PSI's core mission. Now, one question that I do get, so let me answer that up front, is are there now two trap line quantum computing groups? And the answer is yes and no, because we have really a very tight link between Johnson Holmes group at ETH Zurich and my group at PSI. So you can see we share projects, group retreats, talks, even staff. And Johnson's group is basically a founding partner of this quantum computing hub that you can see up there, symbolically, and we are basically that part at PSI. Uh, the team has grown quite a bit, and the takeaway from that slide is basically that for us, engineering also plays a large part. So it's not just PhD students, postdocs, academics, there's a lot of engineers as well, and they are making possible of what we're trying to do. And the research areas that the team covers, you can see here, is quite a number. Um, there's firstly uh, quantum computing system simulation, that basically means taking a normal computer, a high performance computer, and simulating your quantum computer. So that's all theory work. Then there's control software electronics uh, that we also that we jointly develop with uh, Johnson Holmes Group at ETH Zurich. Um, especially control electronics are what really is uh, is key. Um, there's a room temperature setup that's basically, you know, first of all, that classical pole trap that's the original iron trap design, if you will, slightly more advanced, uh, that we also share between the setups. And then there's cryogenic iron traps, because when you want to build something with circuits, or printed circuit boards, and things like that, the materials just tell you better go to cryogenic temperatures. So we have a setup like that. Uh, part that's required for scaling is integrated photonics, and the symbolic uh, pictures here are um, these are grating couplers that come out of a um, silicon substrate uh, to focus on ions in our case, and then active integrated photonics, where it's about modulating light fields, lithium libate, if that rings a bell, or aluminum nitride, piezoelectric actuation, so those are various aspects of light modulation that we're looking at. Um, for us, the qubits are atoms or ions, so we need atom sources. We have a project that looks at uh, a new way to deliver atoms. And then we need lasers because we work with these ions. They don't have cables you can plug in, and there's no sockets to plug in a cable. So we use lasers for that. And that naturally also links to the origin of trapped ion quantum computing, which is actually atomic clocks. So when we turn on our laser systems to do quantum computing, we've just turned on a clock. And that clock is better than a season count clock would be. And so that is kind of the natural overlap there. 
In today's talk, I'll mainly be speaking about these areas because they really are key to scale. So with that, let me uh, jump into a brief introduction to iron traps. So that's one nice picture and with some uh, screws here for scale. So this is a vacuum chamber uh, made out of metal and a big window. And in here, this structure there is an iron trap. And now, where do we get our ions from? Well, we go either to the floor over there, or we bring this up here, the periodic table. Um, which atoms should you use? That's basically the first question. And the answer is quite simple. Those where, when you take off an electron, you end up with something that looks hydrogen-like. So it's just a single outer electron left, so the energy structure is a bit more you know, manageable. And those are the usual candidates, the usual suspects that people use when they work uh, with trapped ions. Some of them have downsides. The cadmium really fell out of favor because the laser systems you need, or uh, mercury, um, are quite uh, <coughs> dangerous, I would say, and uh, basically so far in the UV, you don't want to be hit by that. You don't want to have it run for continuous times because it just degrades everything. So this is why calcium and also terbium, strontium, barium, those are elements that basically people use most of the time. And the way you encode a qubit, a quantum bit, in a um, atomic ion, there are multiple uh, to do it. One is slightly misleadingly called the optical qubit. That needs a ground state, that's where your atoms normally is. And then there's the first excited state and the second excited state. And because this one here is lower in energy, it's also called a metastable state. So the atom, if the electron is excited up here, the outer electron, uh, it won't come down straight away. So this is why we call this state metastable. And the connection to the ground state, this, this channel here, uh, corresponds to an optical photon. So hence the name optical qubit. And you can see coherence times here on the right uh, that are typically found in these systems. And uh, yeah, there's a T1 time, there's a T2 time. But if you really want to have a long living qubit, then you might also resort to these hyperfine ground states. Being ground states, they don't decay. And uh, hence T1 would be practically infinite, unless there's a collision. And T2, the phase coherence um, between these states, if you have a superposition, that can remain for quite some time. This is passive, just 50 seconds. Or if you actively stabilize it, you can push it now. I think it's actually hours uh, that this works. So these are qubit choices and ways to uh, implement qubits. The problem, though, is you have your eye and you want to get your atoms. But when you get your atoms, they usually come in a little metal tube. Let me just point at it again so it's on zoom. Down here, these are these metal tubes. Um, this is where grains of metal are in there. So this is inside the vacuum chamber. And the way we get ions is simply by heating up that metal. So we turn this up. Um, the oven, the ovens down there, go 600 Kelvin or even hotter, depending on the element that you have. And then there's a bit of vapor coming up. And then when it flies, when this atomic vapor flies through the trap up here, we photoionize it. So that means we rip out that extra electron. Suddenly, it's charged. And because the trap is turned on, has electric fields, it keeps it. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, roughly how trapped ions work. Downside being, of course, that, um, upside being the trap can be at room temperature. Downside being that this atom is now really, really hot. So you won't be able to see it. It's just whizzing around with lots of energy. So the fortunate thing is that in the 80s or late 70s, a technique called laser cooling was invented uh, that allows to use photons, so just light beams, to slow down uh, these atoms, to basically take away kinetic energy. And with that, you can really slow them down so much that after Doppler cooling, um, you end up with a picture like this. So this, each dot here is a single ion, so it's a single atomic ion that is trapped in this, in this device here between these metal electrodes. And when you get to these uh, low energies, and this is you know, low energies comparatively, uh, then you actually start to see the trapping potential. And you can start to describe the trapping potential as a harmonic oscillator. So I'm sure those in physics uh, won't wanna, don't want to hear any more about harmonic oscillators, because yet again, it, it shows up. Basically, it means you can now treat the motion quantum mechanically. So there's zero, and there's no motion excitation except for the zero point motion. And then there can be one quantum of excitation and so on. So the motion of these ions can be quantized too, so not just the internal levels. So now we end up with a nice string of ions, nicely lined up. Our qubits are just waiting to be used. Now, how do we do that? Or oh, yeah. I'll show you the temperature here as well. Half a millikelvin is roughly, so 500 microkelvin is what you just get to with uh, cooling. And that's in a room temperature setup. So the whole vessel is at room temperature, and just the lasers bring it down to 500 microkelvin. 
Now, how do we actually manipulate the qubits? Let me give you an example of the uh, optical qubit. So what we can have here is the calcium 40 level scheme. There's our ground state down there. There's the first excited state here. And there's this metastable state that I introduced earlier. Um, the first thing that we do is we connect or assign states. So the way that we describe qubits is usually this block sphere picture, where it's like a, a globe, south pole being a 1, or the north pole being a 0, or spin up and spin down, depends on whether you're more of a physicist, more of a quantum information person, or a computer science person. Go with one or the other. Um, and then we initialize it. So now we're in the ground state, and the upper state uh, we associate with the other qubit state. Now, this is the transition that I meant, so we can use that laser light at 729 nanometers to switch between the two qubit states. And in order to find out which state we are in, we're doing what's called a projective measurement. Yes, question. Um, so, in the energy levels in the harmonic oscillators that are equally spaced, how do we know that we're in state zero or one? Because I think that's the benefit of the anharmonic oscillator, that we know where we are, right? How do we know in what state we are? I'll come to that in a minute when we talk about how you optically probe these systems. But very good question. This is, this is really key. So here, this is now for, now for now not using the motion yet, but the projective measurement allows us when we turn on a laser light at 397 nanometers um, to see whether we are in a ground state. That means the camera looking at that would see a bright ion in false color down there. And if we are projected into the upper state, so if our quantum measurement has pushed us into one of those two states, then we'll see a dark. So this technique is also quite old. Uh, Hans Demel suggested that in the early 80s, called electron shelving, because you put your electron on a shelf. I guess that's how it was told uh, the naming came about. And if you now want to describe a quantum state, for example, the superposition here between the two states, that you could write down here with these coefficients, and you want to learn it by measurement, you just do this repeatedly, let's say 100 times, and then you just look at the statistics. So 48 times it was bright, 52 times it was dark, and that gives you the value of these coefficients. And when we measure, you could also say you do a measurement, but it's in the energy eigenbasis or the sigma z basis. This is really now introducing some quantum terminology for those who are more familiar with it. So that is there. But you could also, of course, uh, find out whether you have something over here. So whether there's a, um, uh, in the other quadratures, basically, by just rotating around the x-axis first or the y-axis before you do the measurement. So you can really tomographically, if you will, explore this state of the single qubit. Now, when you put this all together, you end up with a nice schematic picture like this. Um, I actually rendered at some point ago. And you see your ions, and if you were to look, this is what the computation looks like. So these would be all the measurement results being there. I mean, admittedly, these are quantum drums, so there's no real computation going on. But in reality, you end up with camera images that you can translate to strings, and then you do statistics. You just count how often did I see one or the other uh, observation. And that's how we access one information. So, so far, so trivial, I would say. The only downside being I haven't told you how these qubits can actually talk to one another. Because right now, they're just sitting next to one another in a trap, but they don't necessarily talk to one another. And that has to do with the way that the, uh, you know, the extent of the nuclei and how far they are apart. So if we're looking at the camera picture, it's roughly five microns that they're apart. That's good. So for our wavelength, we can actually access it. But the actual core of the ion, the wave packet of the atom itself, is very well localized, down to 10 nanometers. The ball radius, however, is only 50 picometers. So it's nice. We can resolve fluorescence. We can see them. We can actually address them, send a laser beam to them but they don't talk to one another. Now, what do we do? It's, now we're in an ion trap, all the ions are there, we're ready to go, almost. So now, what's the trick? The trick is that you realize they're in a trap jointly. They're sitting next to one another in a trap, and if you remember Newton's cradle, it's, it's a bit of a, not quite a perfect analog, but basically, they're charged particles, they repel one another. So what forms in here are vibrational modes. The center of mass mode, where they all go together, hence Newton's cradle. And there's other ones, the breezing mode, and I think uh, there's even names for those. There's the rocking mode, there's the Egyptian mode, and there are many, many names, and then there are so many modes that <coughs> run out of names. But basically, we have all these motional modes. And that's great, because and this comes back to the question earlier. When you now put all these ingredients together, you have a laser beam, you have an ion, and you have a harmonic trap, then the motion of that ion in its trap 
leads to uh, side bands that form. And if we were to write down the Hilbert space of this joint system, you would actually describe it as a matter space like that. So these would be Fox states. Um, if you're familiar with the terminology, otherwise that doesn't matter too much. And these are the qubit levels. And transitions between them are the carrier, are the red sideband, and the blue sideband. Where the red sideband is basically you flipping the qubit state, but also taking out one motional quantum. And that to your question, you want to know whether you're in the ground state, you can climb down that ladder, that's in fact what we do with what's called sideband cooling, and eventually no photon gets absorbed because there's no more level here. So if you were to look at this as a fluorescing ion or something, it just goes dark. Like you're at the ground state and then nothing else happens because you've reached the ground state. Now the other question is of course, how high do you go up? If you time your pulses right, you can make a pi pulse so that you're exactly at one phonon and then two phonons and so on but your timing needs to be right, because otherwise equal energy levels will just keep going. So that's, that's the key of uh, the notion. And now maybe the most complicated uh, part of our whole introduction is, how do you create entanglement with this? This entanglement being the spooky action at a distance, if you someone famous, um, is something that is needed as the secret source in all of quantum computing, if you will, and all these operations. You need to be able to create what's called an entangled state. And let's start with these two ions, and again, illustrate where they're coupled to their joint notional modes. I'm just depicting that here, schematically. Um, I also introduced just now that you have these side bands. And now let's imagine we don't take a laser beam to talk to it, a single laser beam, but we talk, take two laser beams at different frequencies. So one of them is slightly what we call red detuned. So it has a lower frequency than the actual qubit transition, and the other one is blue detuned. So it has a higher frequency than the qubit transition. So these are two, let's call them frequencies, so they're optical frequencies. And we have two frequencies, you have two tones, and you turn them on simultaneously, you end up with what's called a beat. You've probably encountered that at least in physics lab or somewhere when there are two tones and they're very close together, you hear this boom, boom, boom this sound. This is called a beat. And if you do it in a way where the detuning is very well controlled and it's close to these side bands, and then you actually end up with an amplitude modulated beam. It's kind of funny, you have two continuous wave beams, you add them together, and they become an amplitude modulated beam. And an even perfect amplitude modulated beam. That's why we actually prefer this to modulating the actual amplitude. Now, all that uh, brought back to what we actually want to do is, we want to get from a state where they're both initialized, the electronic state down there, down, down, and now I've used down down because I'm calling the motional state zero here, and that would just be confusing too many zeros and ones. And we start there, and what we're implementing this, if you work through the math, you'll find out that the Hamiltonian describing this interaction actually has a sigma x, sigma x term. So that also tells you that the eigenbasis of this interaction, so the electronic states that are relevant to the interaction, or the eigenstates to it, are actually not the ones that we identified as zero and one. They are the ones in the x-plane, those two here. So when we are in the ground state, when we start our computation, we're in fact starting in a superposition of the two x-states. And now that's important because there's this x-state, the minus one and the plus one, and if you drive this interaction now and you look at what's called phase space, so this is position and this is momentum here in second quantized form written, then they actually have different directions. One of them has a minus sign. So when we turn this interaction on, this happens. So each of the colors goes one way or the other way, and if you do it just the right amount of time, they come back to the origin. And if you go a circle like this, it just basically means you have an oscillator that's detuned, so we, that's why we detuned them from these sidebands, otherwise we just spiral out. Um, well, not spiral, but actually just move out uh, in one of those quadratures. But it comes back to rest. So at exactly what we call the gate time, which is one over that detuning, they come back to rest, and that's important because we want to end up with qubits that talk to one another and not anything in the motion. So, and that's another thing that's important for later. For quantum computing with trapped ions, you do not care about the motion. The motion is the least relevant thing and it's the one that you want to get rid of. You want to have these ions talk to one another and nothing be left with the motion. And if you do it like this, this works beautifully. But, you know, the motion is actually quite powerful because if you think about adding more of these ions uh, to one another, like I said, they don't interact, so we put a laser beam on top. 
and you look at more of the physics behind it, you see that there's an interaction between these ions that uh, falls off with a power law like that. And that's just based on the joint motional modes. So the spins, spin I and J, talk to one another in the radial direction or the axial direction, just referring to how they are lined up. And what you end up getting, if you look at that optical spectrum, is a real forest. So for three n ions, sorry, for n ions, you get three n motional modes. So a 10 ion crystal gives you 30 motional modes. So it's a whole range of these. Now, they're not just frequencies that you can talk to and then impart, you know, put phonons in. You can actually use them, and yeah, there's the tuning here, the bicomatic field. You can actually use them to engineer the interaction. And now, the COM mode means infinite range connectivity. All these ions work uh, together, so they all are perfectly connected, full connectivity. But then you look at the other modes, this is the tilt one, this one doesn't have a name, or I don't know which one it is. There's more and more. And if you add up all those, you can see that you end up with an interaction graph that actually gives you next neighbor interactions. Now, depending on where in that uh, forest of lines that I've shown you earlier, you put your lasers, you can tune the interaction graph in your system. So between spins, you can really dial in what you want as interactions. And if you had to always sum them up, you, know, you get with this, you get end up with this. But there are fancy techniques uh, out of a domain called corner control, where you can modulate the phases of, uh, of these control fields, and then have some of these modes drop out. So you really have an arbitrary connectivity that you can create in your quantum system. So that's uh, quite powerful, but mainly being used for analog quantum simulations, not so much for computing. But you can use these ideas for computing as well. Now, that was a more theoretical introduction um, into trap ions. What does it actually look like? So that's what uh, my old lab in Innsbruck looked like. Very much a standard research lab, uh, with lots of trap hazards, and of course the fancy lights that are only there when the photographer shows up. <laughs> and the ion trap itself, is here in this vessel in the back, and you can see it's really macroscopic, if you will. The ions themselves <coughs> the would only be 100 microns, and they're trapped between these uh, two end caps. And that, you might say, is maybe not what a quantum computer should look like, because if that's what you need for a 20 qubit system, then maybe you should go elsewhere. You can do that on your laptop far easier. But, you know, this is a real quantum system. But, of course, the notion is not wrong. This is too much. So, newer efforts, and this was uh, funded by European Union Action, is also uh, now part of a spin-out, a uh, company called AQT. They've built the whole thing, this whole lab, into two racks that you can now buy, and based on a press release by the uh, Leibniz Institute in Germany that bought this, or Leibniz Computer Center, I think 9.8 million is what this thing will cost you, just in case you wanted to, to get that. Um, still, you know, very macroscopic. You can still touch that iron trap. And there are, I think in their system, it's maybe 26 that they're selling right now. That's 26 workable qubits. But um, we'll get to the point that 26 is nowhere near enough. And 1,000 is also nowhere near enough. So you need a way forward. So with trapped ions, that notion has been known for quite a while. And the idea to make it scalable is actually that you take your electrodes here. And this is the schematic drawing of a trapped ion system. So these electrodes confine the ion in the radial direction and the two end caps there make sure they can't leave. You can split those electrodes and put them on the surface. And I think this was uh, in a hallway conversation mentioned by Mara Prentice from Harvard to David Weinland, and I think it's in some footnote in some Nobel thing. So basically all the research today is the conversation over coffee uh, in a hallway, where this notion was just suggested, well, why don't you do that? And yeah, this idea has really uh, taken quite some time, but now this forms the basis of all trap ion systems. And you can see that they're very small now. You have these chips over which ions can be uh, trapped. And this is one example from Josh and Holmes group at ETH Zurich, where this is actually fiber optics that bring in laser lights. So you don't send the lights in from the outside anymore, but you can actually send them from the chip and through the chip. And the idea to scale up then, um, in theory, is quite easy. You just tile this together, and then you have a reed head, and you go across it. So that was the proposal you can see in 2000. It's already. Um, uh, quite old. Uh, but another one that's you know, done by experimentalists was also very ambitious uh, that you have this chip and then the ions get shuttled around. So in trap ions, you actually shuttle the information carriers around and then you can form little groups. There can be a memory zone, a storage zone, a processing zone, and then you just shuttle them on the ship. The alternative that was suggested more recently is well, why don't you, uh, why, why do you bother with this? 
why don't you just take small zones, <coughs> put them into little modules here, and then link them up, uh, up via fiber optics. So that's yet another alternative approach. Whichever one to scaling you want to go with, um, I'll prefer this one, um, you have to do quite some engineering. If you have a very good, um, oh, I need to click OK, I realize. Oh, but uh, hopefully the recording worked. I didn't agree to the recording. <laughs> didn't see. Um, the scaling up a unit cell, uh, if you have a good graphics department, then that's what this will look like. So you have a trap ion hovering above a chip, and then laser lights that come out of the chip uh, manipulate the ion. And you can see these various electrode paths. They allow us to move the information carrier around. And then the rest is just scaling, as they say. So you see this is much larger, and you can have ions that get moved on that chip. And again, I love the graphic design team. If reality were so easy, it would be done. But um, you know, that's the general idea. Now, dialing that, or, you know, cooking that down to a um, unit cell, what do you need in terms of ingredients? You need some sort of modulation for your light fields. You need to have some blue <coughs> forming gratings to get the laser beams out. You need an electrode detector. And you need some sort of detector in. So let's talk about some of these. So the first one, to get the lights out of that chip, uh, there's been pioneering work at MIT Lincoln Lab and at ETH. So ETH and Johnson Holmes Group was the first one to show that you can actually create entangling gates with this. So they uh, managed to do a two qubit gate with a high enough fidelity in, in this device. And out of these grating collimators that are embedded here, uh, the light comes. And that's, that's really important because if you have a large system, you just cannot imagine shooting laser beams from the sides and not hitting any of the other ones you don't want to hit. And so that was uh, quite a challenge to get the silicon nitride in there and uh, integrate it with this ion trap. Now, this was in 2020. Of course, the chip was made a bit earlier. Uh, since this Gen 1 trap, there's now a next generation device uh, where we've also included aluminum oxide. So that's to guide blue wavelengths because we don't just need red wavelengths. We need blue close to the UV. There's some other additions. There's a, a, an indium titanium oxide coating on top some changes to the architecture as well. And uh, this whole thing was implemented with a partner, uh, Lionix, on a, on a uh, larger wafer. You can see any of these little squares here is a single iron trap. So we've got a number to play with, and we hope that the yield is greater than one, or at least enough of them work. So far, so good. And what happens here now is that we have the ions uh, in this trap uh, hovering 70 micrometers above that surface. And that gets manipulated by light beams. Now, for one zone, where you could have one or two ions roughly, uh, there are three laser beams, three graded collimators, and about six electrodes that you need. Now, at PSI, because our mission is scaling, uh, we're doing this with 20 zones. That means 60 laser beams, 15 fibers, and 120 electrodes. So this, uh, I don't know of any system that's comparable to this. Um, is basically four linear chains of, of traps where each column is fed by a, a set of, by one fiber and then you can use that you can use that to uh, well investigate how you would go the next step um, the things that we do and this is really now going into what we do at the PSI side um, we investigate how well these trap integrated photonics work and uh, what kind of spot sizes we get. So this is Gillen Beck, a PhD student in Johnson's group who has done lots of these simulations. And we're now characterizing those and find that, yes, it actually works. These are intensity profiles reconstructed from uh, slicing, basically, with the microscope uh, through the planes above that chip. So it works. Light comes out. So that's very good. Now, we need to package it. So this is the early package with just two ions. And now, this is our new design. Uh, and Marty and our team has uh, developed a larger carrier with uh, filter boards for about 400 channels. So this interposer here is just something that we can put in between to swap out the chips. Uh, because we actually have currently a program where we're getting new chips roughly every six months. And then we need to be ready to test them quite quickly. And so this interposer allows us to do that. Uh, the integrated photonics, um, if you want to couple light into this device with a bundle of fibers, um, if you're very experienced and you have really practiced for hours and days and weeks, you can probably do this in about a few hours, three to five hours maybe, manually. Uh, Flavia has now built a system in our team uh, with some commercial hardware, of course, that does that in about a second. So this is really important also to uh, get these fibers connected. 
Now, the strap needs to go somewhere, and this is what Teresa built, or was working on it for her PhD. Uh, she did her master's at EPFL, by the way, so please think more. <laughs> great. Um, so she's building a UHV system, and it's based on several iterations that were at ETH and some experience that we had from NIST as well. And you can see it's a bit more complicated. I'm not going to go through the details, but there's a new metal sheet involved, permanent magnets, uh, PCB, some imaging optics, and you know, charcoal absorbers, lots of fibers and uh, electrical connections. And the whole thing then will go into a cryostat that looks like this. And this one we've actually turned on well, just before Christmas, so we had it decorated. Um, and getting performance now that we can roughly get to about one and a half watts. So this is the cooling power that we have, which is nicely afforded by us being able to run at higher temperatures. So when we talk about cryogenics with trapped ions, it's really more of a convenience thing. So we don't need to go to millicalvin temperatures, where you get maybe a few milliwatts of cooling power. We can stay up there where it's warm comparatively at five Kelvin, and that's where you get lots of cooling power. So that's quite important if you bring lots of electronics in there. Now, we also need the wavelength, and uh, it's a bit of a tough specification because we want these lights to be on and off uh, quite distinctly, so no photons leak, please. And we need many of these. I said 15 fibers go alone into that single chip. So there's a lot of uh, you know, things that we can do in fiber, but mainly these are mostly done free space. So this is just a single light field, a single channel, if you will. Um, and this is already what I would call very integrated. But still, it's 15 centimeters, this block here, uh, with this acoustic modulator. So for one channel, 15 centimeters. If you want to scale that up, that doesn't work. So we're looking at other alternatives, and one of them is uh, on-chip electro-optic modulators. And this is something that we had discussed with CSEM. We're still waiting for the chip. If anyone here has connections, maybe you can remind them. Um, lithium libate EOMs, so electrically optically modulated, uh, electro-optic modulators. But look at the footprint. This is just five millimeters for 16 channels. So integrate photonics is awesome. It's really great. The only downside is it exists at industrial scales at 1500 nanometers. So 1.5 micron, your favorite telephone wavelength, is where you can get all your fanciest uh, integrated photonics, not so much in the visible light domain. And that's actually where also the physics doesn't carry over so easily. So there's a lot of work currently <coughs> collaborating with uh, Rochelle Grunge's group here at ETH. They've made these modulators as well. And we're now getting about 30 dB extinction ratio. That's, that's pretty good for a first off device. It's not optimized yet. Not close to the 60 dB, but um, it's still it's quite good. Uh, another avenue is that we need um, cold atoms. And um, the source for cold atoms, we have this already depicted up there, we call it the quantum guide. Uh, is a way where we bring them in from an external source, so no longer the oven that I showed you earlier that heats to 700 degrees and is right next to it. It's a vacuum disaster. We want to do this externally, so in a <coughs> separate chamber here. And then the idea is to inject atoms into a hollow core optical fiber. So now it's the full thing is here, but basically this is a hollow core fiber that you can see here. This is a photonic structure with a hole in the middle, hence hollow core fiber. And, uh, if you manage to capture cold atoms above, then there are groups that manage to actually bring them into this fiber. It's not trivial, because if you try to uh, hit an atom into a 10, well, sub 10 micron hole, five microns roughly here, uh, less than that, um, it's not so easy. They usually bounce off. Nonetheless, uh, we decided to propose this and try it, and uh, not propose 10 centimeters, but five meters, which was probably a bit optimistic, but. We're working on it, and uh, the goal being that then you'd have your atom source out there and you bring it in through this, just like the light, through a polycore fiber into your uh, system. And the reason why you want cold atoms is that these surface traps, they're not as strong as these big bulky traps that you could do. The one that I showed you as an illustration there, these are very deep, so there you can have extremely hot ions and they won't leave. They'll stay there, they can stay for a week, but then you can't scale it. If you do things on a surface like this, the traps are very weak, so if they come out of an oven, you capture maybe the last 0.1% of your distribution, your Boltzmann, Mecklenburg Boltzmann, they will fly away, and then if you're lucky, you get some. But if you manage to cool them first and then deliver, that would be uh, a key enabler. And the way that we, uh, way that we do this is, uh, first, we want a simple source, so this is actually a way to make a magneto-optical trap, so neutral atoms. Uh, we always like to say the non-charged ions, 
Um, they can be trapped here with a single beam. And in fact, just January this year, we actually managed to get the first blob. These are calcium atoms at PSI. Um, we want to miniaturize that, so we had a company in Switzerland in Tencino, Femtoprint, that made us little pyramids like that, a few millimeters across, you can see. The first batch didn't quite work, but you now it's a work in progress. And then what's missing now, of course, is injecting that into this, this fiber. But luckily, as part of this quantum guide consortium, uh, we have a group in Darmstadt in Germany, and they do this. And it works perfectly, kind of perfectly. But uh, it does work yet with rubidium atoms. And because everyone has their favorite atom, rubidium is super easy. So if you want to do anything with neutral atoms, my highest recommendation, rubidium. Proven, tried and true, works well. Calcium, not recommended. But I think a rubidium mod would probably be a huge blob here. Calcium, you can see, is just this faint glow here. So calcium is not the best element for this. But you know, we're trying it nonetheless, because we're trapped iron folks, we don't need many. For us, if 10 atoms make it out of the fiber, fine, that's good enough for us not hundreds of thousands that you would need otherwise. <coughs> okay, I'm slowly running out of time, I think. Um, so I should now actually talk about some details on the quantum error correction, for example, and then simulation afterwards. So quantum error correction here, again, nicely depicted by a graphic artist. Uh, this is your fault-tolerant quantum computer, in theory, right? But perfectly working. This is the color code, and I think there's at least some people in the audience who know the color code. Uh, that's the depiction of it, and that's what I'm going to uh, use to explain to you how quantum error correction works, in a nutshell. So the way it works is that you bring together, or you string up your information, not in a single uh, physical information carrier, not a single qubit, but you bring many of them together. And one good way to show this is, and I'm going to do yeah, it's a bigger triangle, is to bring them together into what's so-called uh, plaquettes. So we have this group of four qubits, and that up here, and then there are four qubits down there. And they're all linked together. We give that a color, hence the name color code, to identify those groups. And now the tricky bit with quantum error correction is you need to correct errors, but for that you would need to know that there are errors, but you're not allowed to look, because it's quantum. And as you well know, when you measure something in quantum mechanics, you project it into some class or some state. But that also means that you've just suddenly erased all the information and you're stuck. So how do you get to know that there's an error without looking? Well, or without asking this direct question, what is your state that you're in? What you're actually doing here is this is what's called a parity. So these are the expectation values of these uh, qubits and the z-basis, so something in block speed, z-basis and x-basis, multiplied together. So if I obtain this as a parity, positive or negative, um, I do not know the state of any of the single participants. I only know the parity. And now we have these three groups, and we ask them, so what's your parity? And if they give me the answer, and I note them down, and I see, oh, it was the same answer that I had before, then I know, okay, great, I'm in the same code space, nothing has happened. But if, say, one of the groups changes their opinion, say, the blue ones say, no, no, my parity is now this, but the other two haven't, then I know the only one that's, uh, that could be affected is qubit 5. But if all of them change their opinion, that must be qubit 3. If these two change their opinion, it must be qubit 2. So based on the observation of these what's called syndromes, I can deduce where an error occurred and can correct it directly. Of course, that's a bit simplifying here. Um, there are different kinds of errors. There are phase flip errors. There are bit flip errors. So this get, becomes a lot more complicated. But again, that would fill easily an hour just to talk about that. Um, a simple circuit here shows you that seven qubits for this color code would be enough. Um, you actually need a bit more, but we'll get to that. And if you put that all together, this on the x-axis is the single qubit physical error rate. Um, and this is where the logical qubit error rate, or the recovery probability is what's shown here in this old paper. If you beat that black line, then you're in business. And so the ideal code for a small enough error, let's say up to 4% or you know, something like that, you would be better than the bare physical qubit. Um, well, in the non-ideal world, that means in real life, it's not quite there. And this was an old demonstration of this. So it's, it's improved slightly, but the principle is still that for a certain um, single qubit error rate, you can do better than if you didn't do anything. And then <coughs> it's just scaling, just like before. Now, this was all theory. This actually happened. And it was largely funded by a program that I would call 
one of the least known, most expensive, and most rewarding programs, uh, at least that I've been involved in. So this was funded by the US government uh, for yeah. 2015 to 2023. COVID extended it a bit. It was originally a five-year program. And the goal was to demonstrate a logical qubit. And there were uh, four consortia that ran. One of them was actually IBM. There was another superconducting qubit consortium and two trapped ion teams. And I was part of one of them. And we managed in 2021, 2022, to then build logical qubits. So this is Andreas Varov's group at ETH Zurich. They have their 17 <laughs> superconducting qubits to build, a, in this case, a surface code. And the proof of concept for the color code was done with 10 trap ions. So all these consortia uh, achieved the goal. But all of us did one thing that you will not find in the error correction papers. Um, it will be indirectly there. We didn't do error correction. We basically gathered all the results. And then we sorted through them. And where the ones where that flags showed up, syndromes showed up that there was an error, we discard the data, and then we keep the good stuff. There was no active correction. This is basically post-selection. You know, we're, we're error detection, error detecting, and then we throw away the bad data. Pretty much all error correcting papers that you see out there do exactly this. Active feedback is hard. Nonetheless, Honeywell, I called them the dark horse because I took our color code, hired one of our postdocs, and went away and did it. So it's the same principle, uh, just that you have three more ions, so 10 in total, uh, to detect these syndromes that you can see on the right. That linear ion trap uh, with 20 ions in total. These are just helping ions, but the logic ions were the perturbing ones. And then I'm not going to go through the details, but you can kind of see that just encoding something in quantum error correction is a messy uh, thing. And then also reading out what the uh, errors are. There's this thing called flag qubits because some of these readouts might also contain errors. If you are in this field, then you know it becomes extremely involved. Yet they pulled it off. And they, in the end, managed to feed back, infer the syndromes to code, and apply correction. So they've actually, for the first time, closed the loop. Yet, you will also notice they didn't manage to publish this in Nature. Because before that, all the other papers came that had demonstrated error correction without actually closing the loop. And so, uh, knowing some of the backstory, the trouble was finding referees that would say, OK, this is good. And uh, eventually, here, I think it came out in PRX is a good journal. But it's kind of funny that you know those that actually demonstrated the first closed loop uh, didn't get the cover I mean, because this is the main plot. This is really good. Um, but the one thing that we want to actually know is does it help? And uh, it's reality, so it only helps so much. So when you repeat this, there's too many errors that accumulate, so it actually gets worse over time. So the more error correction cycles you run, you ruin the system, but it's kind of expected. So they have a pretty good error model to understand what's happening in their system. And so they use that model now to predict how good would you need to be and what do you need to improve. And what you always want to see is that if the physical uh, error rate gets slower, you also want to see that your logical error rate gets slower. An alternative plot would be a code distance here. But you want to see some line, and you want to get below this um, dashed line. And they found that in their case, it doesn't help yet. They are stuck here. So this is the break-even threshold point. They're stuck there. But if you were to improve the leakage, for example, in their case, then it would scale as expected. So the logic error rate would keep going down. Now, as I said, co-distance is another alternative. This is now from Google. Google has also then published, just a bit later, a paper where they've done that with more qubits, but far more than what we had. Industrial efforts, they can do this. Um, you see the same kind of scaling. So the logical error per cycle um, goes down, and it keeps going down. And uh, this is as they increase the code distance. That means you take more qubits to make a logical qubit, and the error rate keeps going down. So the theory of quantum error correction holds. We can do it. It's just not easy. And there may be potential issues. And this one here, sorry for all the superconducting uh, attendance. This is a bit of a side step. Uh, radiation is a problem. And Google showed that you can't go down there. So down there, you'd have to throw away data again. So this is really post-selected. Cosmic rays are a problem. Atoms are very tiny. Superconducting circuits are rather large. But that also means you can engineer them, make them smaller, make them radiation hard. So this doesn't need to be the end of the game. Uh, but it was seen here and in other groups as well. But nonetheless, if it works as you want, the air correction can work. That also means that um, after these prototypes that were made uh, not too long ago, there's now a follow-on program that we're also part of called ELK with a very uh, you know, 
fitting logo. Um, that's to bring two logical qubits together. So we're not at a thousand something physical qubits, we're talking <coughs> from one qubit to two qubits, but logical this time. And that's again a four year program that we just started, in fact. And to bring a bit of perspective into the size question, this is something I love from you know, Google Group. They have this nice drawing, you know, we are here, and now we start tiling it together. And eventually we get to this device here, and with a uh, person for scale, it gives you the impression that this looks similar to that person for scale at the CMS detector at CERN. And that's, by the way, the detector that uh, PSI makes. So the, the chip uh, at the core of this detector comes from PSI. And that also tells you that we are pretty much in awe by the engineering, by the number of cables, and by that this whole thing actually works, that that really was a big draw to come to PSI to access this technological base. And now I think I have just one minute left, or maybe three. 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 Great. Oh, three. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll swap hats just really quickly uh, to talk about quantum uh, simulation and solving chemistry problems. And um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, if you have a digital quantum computer, this is your favorite gate based uh, system. You can run your standard textbook algorithm called phase estimation to really learn all that quite happily. Problem being that this requires a device that can run for a week which we don't have. Now the short term uh, solution was to call what's called a variational quantum eigensolver. So that means you have part of this, uh, the problem that I executed on the quantum device, part of it on a um, classical device, and then you run a loop like that. Zoe is your point of contact, and you want to learn anything about VQEs and the problems, or how to get around those problems. So this has been quite an exciting area, because with that, we can actually push things further before waiting for phase estimation to actually work. Now, people have used that and have done lots of simulations. You can see, this is thanks to Ryan Babish, a good overview slide of all the photo dissociation curves. So basically, these are energy levels of where a molecule is bound and how it dissociates, and then there's the repulsive potential as you get there. So calculating static problems has been done, also some excited states, extensively. You can see that over the uh, years here. This is water, just the tip of the iceberg, so not really full water, but that's been done. And so what always brings, <laughs> comes to the table there is ground state energies we've done, um, but it's always a static problem. The Born-Oppenheim approximation, that rings a bell, frees your nuclei in space, then you only have to solve the electronical problem, which is hard enough, you can't really do it, but if you didn't freeze the nuclei, all would be lost at the beginning. But the problem is the interest in chemistry, dynamics, happens elsewhere. So if you want to understand, for example, how we can see, how you can see these slides, this is rhodopsin, a molecule in your eye that when hit by a light field, um, or by a photon basically, absorbs the energy and changes shape. So this is called uh, cis-trans, so they, you can see it's basically like a molecular switch. This flips from this configuration to that configuration up on absorbing a photon in a femtosecond. So really, really fast dynamics, and this really needs nuclei that move. And so with that, we set out to say, OK, um, can we build something around that? Can we use analog approaches, use these bosonic nodes, the motion that I've shown you earlier, but not discard it as in, oh, it's just a cable connecting qubits. Let's get rid of it. No, but actually, it doesn't do computation like that. And so when we ran uh, our theory uh, framework, classical chemistry you can really not capture, <laughs> hence this kind of open cone. There are so many methods. But it scales roughly in terms of resources like that. Whereas the quantum approaches, if you had a quantum device and you did, say, uh, digital quantum simulation, then you end up with a scaling like that. And if you want to plot it more impressively, then you do it to the linear scale and uh, show it like that. So, but here, the key thing is that here we're using bosonic nodes. So we call it a multi q dot q dot boson simulator. And the number of modes that scale up quite quickly, you can get that with trap ions fairly easily. You can also get it with circuit QED. So superconducting circuits, when they have resonators, they also describe, I think we heard about the harmonic potential. You have the same kind of degree of freedom, which is usually not being used because we're going to stay in the low area. But why not go higher? Why not have you know, higher phonon numbers? Now, we used this um, and decided to do the hydrogen of chemical dynamics, uh, which is called pyrazine. Uh, it's a molecule that you can describe quite simply with a single qubit. So this is a single qubit, not hundreds, not thousands. And two harmonic oscillators. So you take two motional modes, 
and a single qubit, and you can see those are the motional modes, and these are the qubit modes, so it's just one qubit, and that's the circuit we ran. And then we extract some data, just glossing over it, this look, these are characteristic functions that we measure for those oscillator states, and then we transform them back into what we were actually after, which is a wave packet that we simulated. And the question in chemistry, which turns out is really highly thought after in chemistry, we weren't realizing that at the beginning, is how conical intersections or the rock points, if you're more of a solid state person, uh, how wave packets travel around them. And there is this thing called, well, there's destructive interference because it's a quantum phenomenon. So the wave packet doesn't just go around, but the phase actually matters, so it bounces back. And that's exactly what we saw here in the experiment. So you do not tunnel around, you actually bounce back. And so the results were that, and of course, being at the University of Sydney, we have lots of outreach, and then you, I think there's even sound. Yeah, so <laughs> slowing something down by a billion times. We have a good marketing department, is basically what I need to say. Um, and this is what it looks like when the University of Sydney uh, produces a press release. Um, long story short, and joking aside, what I mean to say here is that, um, music off, um, is that using so far unused degrees of freedom or things that we have ignored for our quantum computer building, like these harmonic oscillators, can be quite enabling. And in fact, when we had this paper published, biologists started calling me, and I got questions from all over chemistry, asking, oh, where can we simulate this or that and that? Okay, hold your horses, this is two harmonic modes only, and we barely managed to control them like that, so this is really back to square one in qubit land, as if we had just discovered a qubit. And there's more related to this also for quantum computing. So there are these bosonic codes. GKP may ring a bell for some. So those are alternative means of storing quantum information in modes like that. So this avenue, I would say, is quite promising. And even though I've told you uh, it will take quite a long time to actually build the big error corrective quantum computer, there's a lot to be had in the meantime, and potentially some advantage around the clock. We never know. And with that, let me thank you for letting me go. an outlook, uh, com comparative outlook between uh, the two frontiers of uh, trapped iron uh, and uh, Rindberg atom. We had this morning, just this morning, uh, Ivana Dimitrova from, from, uh, from, the, from uh, Michel Rubin's group presenting us uh, last uh, results. And uh, so my question is, can you, can you give us a comparative outlook and also perhaps the fancy question, can't you make uh, a Rindberg ion? that interacts like Rilberg atoms, uh, but uh, you can move it around uh, like an ion. In fact, you can, and that's Jonathan Holmes' work. So they're actually uh -huh. trying to do this, I mean, differently. So, you, okay, I take that back. So they're using a Rilberg state and then treat the core like an ion, which is one way of looking at the problem. But Marcus Heinrich in Stockholm, they're actually doing Rilberg ions, and also Fabian schmidt Carla in Mainz, they've done a lot of work on that. And then you have exactly the beautiful Rydberg physics. You have blockade effects, you have long-range interactions. And if you combine that with the surface trap like the one I've shown you, then you can shuttle them around. And it should be possible. So this, this bit, I'm, yeah, I think there's just, this is a much interesting frontier. And on the first question, the Michal Lukin, Cuera. So Cuera is actually part of the ELK program too. So in this new uh, IAPA program, we have one ion team where we are part of. There is a superconducting circuit team, that's Andreas well Varas' team. There is Guerra and Lukin, so the uh, neutral atom community, which have just really exploded into this. And there is a very small team from the University of Sydney, uh, Stephen Bartlett, and two more people using IBM's cloud service. IBM is not part of it, but they are using their services. It's a very uh, peculiar arrangement, um, but that's what the current contenders are. And of course, it's extremely impressive what they're doing. So these trees are arrays that they have, and they move around these atoms. There's a storage zone, and then they bring in other atoms, and they can do basically arbitrary connectivity. If you're into quantum error correction codes, LDPC codes suddenly are accessible, so fancy things that you can do, and they have some very good demonstrations also of that in their recent paper. Yet there's a downside too, and that's, I think in their setup, when you do measure, you do, it's a destructive measurement. Reloading takes time, and 
this might not be the end of it because there are efforts to do this differently. You can detect without destroying it. So this has been shown as proof of concept, so this would not be the end of the road. But it takes time to move atoms. So if you have to move them in these optical tweezers, that's the one time that's never given. The gate speeds are great. Rydberg uh, states that they use, these are like superconducting circuits fast, so nanoseconds. But moving the atoms around to their new place is what's really the bottom line. But that's also slow now, isn't it? Uh, in ions, you can do it a bit faster because we have better confinement. But these ions but it's still a time that's not quoted that you kind of need to take account of when you say all uh, It's actually, well, it depends because when you when you do in smaller groups, the also all kind of is free. You don't yeah, need yeah, shuttle. Yeah, yeah, but when you're doing these little compartments, when you're doing compartments your which no one actually is doing. So it's trapped ions. Continue doing that. Yeah, and no. no. They have a, yeah, yes and no. So they have the, the, the <laughs> Then, yeah, how do I say this friendly? <laughs> so it's a linear chain, um, yeah. and then you can close the loop, and yeah. they call that a racetrack uh, trap, which is quite nice. And actually not invented by them, but done by NIST 10 years ago, and they haven't mentioned that or even quoted, cited the paper, so shame on them for that. But it's basically still a 1D thing. You go around the circle, yeah. and that takes time, just as yeah. you say. But what you actually need is, uh, you need to go around corners, you need to have different zones, and that is tricky, but it's also been demonstrated. So shuttling around corners can be done, and then the time scales are, I would say, they're not super fast, but they're a bit faster than with the atoms, uh, but the idea then being, if you combine that with photons, and you have your local areas, and you have the integrated photonics, you could also link up different chains without ever moving them on the chip. And so, I'm not saying the ions are in the lead there, I'm just saying, or want to say basically, we all share the same problems, even though the neutral atoms came out of nowhere and really got up there. At the uh, closed kickoff meeting that we had for the IAPA program, which is not public, uh, the presentations were very different, let's say. Far more um, on the honest side, uh, where things are challenging, and there are a lot of challenges. So I wouldn't say that I'm at a point now where I can really say much about that because this comes as part of the program that we now have to all demonstrate running these logical qubits repeatedly, reliably, and I are in our next uh, trying to find why it doesn't work. Um, so we'll learn more, but it's, it's super impressive. And I mean, if you look at trap ions starting, superconducting circuits come up to also computing much faster than the ions, and now the neutral atoms just come around the corner, and bam. It's super impressive. So let's see, maybe tomorrow in B-centers? Who knows? Could be another technique. So from the trapped ion perspective, so through your presentation, it's just my impression is it seems a lot more like a tech, uh, it's an engineering issue. So I'm just wondering to advance a trapped ion uh, to have a more the, the the bigger, more function, high performance quantum computer based on a trapped ion. Where is the biggest battle? Like, is there already a science foundation is already there, but it's like more like having a better lab facility with a better chips, more engineers can do the trial and error. Would, I'm just wondering where would be the, 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 the bigger battle that is, whether it's a money problem, whether it's actually a brain problem. I think it's both. And uh, I mean, you could see one example where certainly the engineering and being at the corporate has helped, and that's Honeywell. Okay. They have 200 engineers behind one of their systems. We have three. <laughs> so you can see it's a bit of an unfair comparison, but hence they were able to pull off this real-time error correction. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot to be learned about the codes, about the decoding. So there's such an enormous amount of science still needed, which then suddenly gains your orders of magnitude. Yeah. So, for example, the news realization was that these LDPC codes, these particular types of error correction, um, there's one paper, I think, that was done by IBM, in fact, um, they found that they can do with uh, four, I mean, with 288 qubits, they can do the work of two or 4,000 okay. qubits, okay. just so by switching the code. Okay. And that's pure research. And so then, of course, that dictates how technology needs to evolve. And if technology involves in, say, yet another direction, there may be, again, new opportunities. And so it's, it's really right at these crossroads between science, applied science, and engineering. And I don't think it's going to go in either direction anytime soon. We'll need all of them okay. for quite some time to come. Thanks. Uh, ask the same question to me, uh, um, In the two encodings that you have uh, shown at some point, uh, 
uh, are these two encodings uh, um, noise biased? And in this case, uh, do you plan to use uh, specific error correction codes that would take advantage of the noise bias? So we know that uh, yeah. in general, error correction codes take advantage of that for a higher threshold, but also uh, if they are designed specifically, they can, can be improved even more. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely one of the very open questions. You know, can we exploit that fact and uh, make our codes a bit more intelligent? The good thing is also that Stephen Bartlett is there because they had lots of the work on the noise bias and Steve Flamia, uh, this is the old Sydney Mafia doing this. Um, our Mafia, I'm part of it, so <laughs> it's uh, doing this. And uh, yeah, that gave tremendous uh, improvements in the surface code and in other you know, on platforms like Sydney like Circus where you have some sort of noise bias or but if you have, say, now uh, a Kirk head cube, the game is different. Then the question is, is this now a leakage? Or what, what is your new bias uh, direction? And for trapped ions, uh, there's also something like that. This is what Continuum found with the leakage being actually the dominant factor. Um, but then there are new ways to encode. So now we're, we're thinking about, it's really called OMG. So optical, metastable, and ground state qubits. And they publish it as OMG. So the OMG approach uh, converts different ways of storing qubits inside the ion. So you can get around, uh, you, you shuffle them to a long lived state and your leakage goes away because you're, too, you're far removed from the computational subspace and then you bring it back. So there may be ways to de-bias the noise. Uh, that depends then again on your encoding. So these are things that we are looking at exactly in this program. Okay. Um, how are people feeling about time? <laughs> it, it, runs. It, it runs. It happens. <laughs> Let's. Okay. Try and answer in three sentences. Tyson. Oh, uh, a really quick, specific question then. Um, on that uh, scalable chip uh, iron trap, um, do you still have the neighboring qubits that can exhibit collective modes? Or are you completely foregoing those and just having communication between the uh, ions you shuttle close to each other? You can manipulate all the potentials such that you can do one or the other. So that's open how we use it. So you might have like a line that can't be shuttled, but you can shuttle in ions to the sides of them to talk. But you can also break the line up and shut part of it this way or that way. So it's really individual control. OK. Ditto. Do you want to do your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that. This is really, really inspiring. So I mean, my feeling was also that integrated photonics is extremely important to what you want to do. And you showed, of course, this uh, one example of electron demodulators and ex uh, extinction ratio minus 30 dB. Like, what is most needed right now from your perspective um, to, to make all of this happen? I mean, you talked about, you know, coupling in and out of the chips. I wonder also a little bit of all the other scattered lights that, uh, you know, maybe is not focused into a proper, uh, you yeah. know, well-defined trap and all, all of these things. Can you just elaborate a little bit what are the things from integrated photonics perspective that are most important? So I have three sentences and now only two left. You can stay three. I'll be generous. Three. Okay, great. <laughs> so the switching. So these, these yeah. matrices to really shrink down the systems, also for neutral atoms, not just for ions. Yeah. So anyone working with optics requires that in the visible domain. The other thing is detectors. Mm -hmm. Right now we're having a camera outside, and we need a vacuum window, and we need lots of extra effort just in terms of the optical imaging. Mm -hmm. If we were to be able to put detectors next to it, and then image the ions straight onto the detector in a little sandwich of flow, that would solve a lot of technical problems. Uh -huh. okay. Cool. Okay. Let's thank Connie again.